Uh, it's 9.05 already. Maybe we can start. Maybe we'll start a bit slowly at the beginning uh, because like, <laughs> people may join late. Uh, anyway, um, good morning. Uh, my name is Chi Hu Chang. I'm the Senior Director of uh, Development at APNIC. Uh, as you may know, uh, APNIC is the IP address registry. Uh, we hand out IP addresses. And, uh, but we also do internet development work uh, you know, for capacity building, especially training. And uh, we do want to do more work with the RAN community uh, uh, through APAN and Asia Connect and, and others. And that's why, like, uh, we try to do training every time at the APAN meetings. Uh, and this time, uh, we'll you know, do a segment routing tutorial. Uh, it's a uh, one-day tutorial. And in order to get the most out of this training, I highly encourage you to attend the whole day. <laughs> um, don't just attend you know, one session or two. Um, and, and then, of course, hopefully you can like have a good understanding of the technology. I myself uh, cannot do training on this topic. Uh, I'm uh, not technical enough to do it. Uh, but uh, we have Makito. Uh, he is uh, you know, uh, a new trainer. He just joined us uh, half a year ago. Yeah. yeah. Um, and... Uh, he, of course, is well trained uh, in this area. And uh, he's, in fact, from uh, Cambodia. Uh, but like he worked in Myanmar for five, quite a while, years. for five years. And he can speak a lot of different languages, including Cantonese, Mandarin, <laughs> English, of course, and uh, a lot of uh, other languages. Um, so uh, like if you... Uh, yeah, want to test his language capability? Yeah, you can try it. Uh, uh, before I hand it over to uh, Makito, I want to say something. Uh, in fact, APNIC is uh, you know working with uh, Ten CC Asia Connect to try to arrange uh, training for uh, at least ten of the entrants uh, in the region. Of course, those would be Asia Connect uh, partners. Um, so that you know, after it's confirmed, yeah, and uh, I, I, I think there will be an announcement. And uh, you know, if we come to your like, uh, like uh, country economy, yeah, I encourage you to, you know, attend the training because I think uh, it will be at least uh, you know, we will cover uh, you know something relevant to uh, the NREN or REN uh, operations. And uh, if you, of course, uh, cannot attend, uh, you should also uh, share the like uh, the news to your colleagues, uh, your 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 your, your, your uh, like community, so that like uh, more people can uh, can be trained. Um, anyway, uh, that's all I want to share. I now pass the mic to Makita. Okay, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to AP Next Segment Routing Tutorial Session at APEN 57. Before we start, let me go through the introduction and agenda for today's training. Here is a little bit about myself. I am Makito. I am currently a network analyst and technical trainer at AP Next. Before joining AP Next, I had been working with the ISP and telecom industry for approximately 18 years. I initially started as a programmer, then gradually shifted my career from programming to networking. Along the way of my career, I have obtained several vendor certificates like Cisco CCIE, Juniper JNCIP, and Microtech MTC INE. My areas of interest are BGP, MPLS, and IPv6. Sometimes I still enjoy writing code and building database like I did two decades ago. I'm really glad to have opportunity to join this APEN event and happy to meet everyone here. 
Also, I brought along with me some gift here in the front table. Then some of you, if you would like to grab some, you can come and take. Also, my business cards are on the table. For the agenda today, we have totally four sessions, which the first two sessions focus on MPLS, and the last two sessions are about segment routing with MPLS data plan, or SR MPLS. In session one, I will run through the slides of introduction to MPLS and LDP. Then in session two, we will work on a hands-on exercise together. It is a virtual lab for configuring LDP and an MPLS layer 3 VPN service using Cisco iOS XE platform. And after the lunch, session three will be another presentation about segment routing, specifically SR MPLS. Then in session four, we will work on another lab to configure SR MPLS and traffic engineering using Cisco IOS XE platform. While this is basically our plan today, but it is flexible to adjust if the planned activities in specific session might take longer or complete earlier. Let's say if we finish the lab earlier, maybe I will go into the segment routing presentation earlier because it has more than 100 slides then uh, if we can start, start early also, it is good. Here are some resources of the training today. All presentation slides and links to our virtual labs are available in the course material page. There is also a survey link here. A survey link here that I would like to request for your feedback after the training. Please let us know what you like about this training or what we can still to improve. Also, if you have any technical questions after the training, feel free to write an email to our community trainers mailing list, community trainers at apnic.net. Your email will be received by our community trainers who are specialized in different topic domains. The relevant subject matter expert may pick up your technical questions and answer to you. And by the way, the link of the course materials is also available on the schedule page of APEN. Let me show to you. This is the schedule page. And then if you scroll down until the end of the description here, there is a link, cost materials. And if you click on the link, then it will bring you to APNIC Academy webpage. And here has all our presentations, including additional resources and the link to the virtual lab. For example, in session one, we will talk about MPLS. So these are the two presentations that I will be presenting. And then in session two, we will do the lab. So this is the link to access the lab. And of course, there are some additional resources. It can be another APNIC training or additional external resources. So you can see at the resource column. Let me share the screen again. Okay. APNIC Academy is a free to public platform built by APNIC. There are many online courses and virtual labs covering topics from introduction to advanced, such as routing, cybersecurity, and IPv6. In addition to these, we do offer technical assistance to our members. APNIC members are able to book technical assistance session with one of our subject matter experts. As you can see here, some of them are listed on the APNIC Academy technical assistance platform. And then you can reach out to them to discuss specific technical issues. If you are interested in participate in any upcoming APNIC training, please follow our upcoming events in the APNIC Academy website. In the training today, we will do our lab using virtual labs on the APNIC Academy platform. There are two ways to access the virtual labs either to click on the menu courses, then click on virtual labs, or to access directly using a specific virtual lab URL, like what we provided in the course material. Please note that you will need an APNIC Academy account to access the labs. You can register now if you did not have one yet. 
the registration is quite straightforward. It only requires some basic information plus an email address. The user who registers for an APNIC Academy account does not need to be an APNIC member. And after registering your account, please make sure that you allow pop-up for APNIC Academy website. Because once you launch the lab, the website will open a new window. So if pop-up is not allowed, the window will not appear. All the labs in APNI Academy are available 24 by 7, meaning you can repeat the labs that we will use in this training anytime later. In case you have started the lab but cannot complete it, it is possible to save the progress and continue to do it within seven days. Yes, and everything is free. You can access all the labs. The labs are not only limiting to today's training, but also there are many others you can explore in the APNIC Academy website. And here I will run through a few promotion slides. APNIC is a membership-based organization. Many of our policies are community-driven. Any of you can participate in the process of proposing, discussing, and expressing your opinions about the policies. If you are interested in this, please visit apnic.net slash community slash policy slash participate. Another promotion that I need to do would be our upcoming Apricot 2024 and APNIC 57 conference that will happen in Bangkok from 21st February to 1st March. There will be trainings, community discussion, and experience sharing on best practices for internet operations. Register and grab your ticket today by visiting 2024.apricot.net slash register slash register. APNIC also hosts a variety of mailing lists. It is a place for community to connect, discuss, and share information for special interest groups, community topics, and other general discussion. For more information, visit orbit.apnic.net. To stay in touch with APNIC and follow our latest updates, please visit blog.apnic.net for our blog post and apnic.net slash social for our social media. That's all for my introduction slide. Do you have any question before we start? It's okay. So uh, let me switch to the first presentation. Okay, in this presentation, we will introduce the history and general overview of MPLS as well as the application and services that MPLS can support. The reason why we need to start to talk about MPLS because later today we will talk about segment routing on MPLS data plan. So just to prevent some of the audience here, maybe they are not exposed to MPLS previously, then I add some MPLS introduction to let you understand about how MPLS works and also the applications that we can use with MPLS. Basically, why we need MPLS. First of all, let's talk about what is MPLS. MPLS stands for Multi-Protocol Level Switching. The name basically describes what it does. MPLS uses a label to encapsulate and forward packets instead of using destination address like in the regular IP routing. This is known as the level switching. And MPLS supports multiple kinds of network layer protocols such as IPv4, IPv6, IPX, CLNP. Therefore, it is multi-protocol level switching. Means you can put multiple protocols on this level switching. The initial motivation of having MPLS was back in mid-1990s. At the time, the standard way of IP routing, which looks up the destination address of the packet against the IP forwarding table, was considered more complex and time-consuming. Because IP address lookup typically uses the method of logical N plus the longest match. The processing power at that age was not as good as now. Imagine if a router needs to forward millions of packets per second, 
it will require a relatively powerful hardware to support this inefficient lookup process. That's why the idea of level switching comes from here. What if we can forward the packet with a simpler header, which does not require the process of logical M plus the longest match? With MPLS technology, core routers in the network no longer needs to look up the destination address of the packet. They can forward packets more efficiently based on a simplified MPLS header. While the initial motivation of having MPLS was for solving performance issue of IP routing, nowadays, thanks to the evolution of the technology, destination address lookup is no longer an issue for modern hardware. Because basically, maybe now my, my phone CPU is even more powerful than a server CPU many years ago. Therefore, the main use case of MPLS has shifted from level switching to multi-protocol. At the beginning, they want level switching. But now level switching is not the main point. It is about multi-protocol. Instead of using MPLS to speed up the packet switching, MPLS is now more commonly deployed for enabling single service provider core network to provide multiple services, such as global internet, IP VPN, layer 2 VPN, or bandwidth guarantee, or low latency link. Yeah, you can do all the things with only single service provider core network. This is an example topology of a service provider MPLS core network that provides virtual private network or VPN services to its customer. P or provider routers in this diagram are core routers in the service provider network that will forward the packet with MPLS levels only. They do not need to understand anything below the levels. Basically, any protocol you can put under the levels. And the PE here, provider H are the routers that are facing to customer. They typically need to understand both MPLS and the protocol that customers are running. At the customer side, CE or customer H are the equipment that customer run. It can also be an equipment that the ISP installed for the customer. This equipment does not need to run MPLS. For MPLS layer 3 VPN, it is also known as IP VPN. It's a VPN service that the service provider will participate in customer's routing. Customer may run a dynamic routing protocol with the service provider to advertise their routes from their CE to the service provider's PE. Then the service provider will propagate the customer routes further to other PEs at the other VPN sites. So the PE at other VPN sites will then re-advertise those routes to their relevant CE so that the customer will have end-to-end -end reachability between the VPN sites. So basically, customer will advertise the route to a wider PE, and then this PE may advertise to this PE, and then after that, this PE will advertise to this customer CE. So from VPN site 1 to site 2, they will have end-to-end -end reachability through the provider MPLS core. This is layer 3 VPN. On the other hand, there are some other types of VPN like MPLS layer 2 VPN. The service provider does not need to participate in customer's routing. Basically, the service provider will act as a switch that provides layer 2 connectivity between the customer VPN sites. So for the customer, they will have the direct layer to reachability to another site. Then they can run whatever protocol they want on top of this layer two connection. Besides the VPN, another important use case of MPLS would be traffic engineering or TE. In regular IP routing, packets are forwarded based on the destination address. And due to this nature, it is challenging to route the packet with the same destination address through different paths. For example, a service provider would like to offer two classes of service, the standard-based effort routing and a bandwidth guarantee path. For the customers who can pay for the premium service will be routed over the bandwidth guarantee path. In this case, it is technically possible to achieve with policy-based routing, 
but the configuration is relatively complex and not scalable because you need to go and configure hub by hub on all the routers. With MPLS TE, the service provider can direct certain traffic to a specific path without needing hub by hub configuration like PBR. And MPLS TE not only enables the service provider to offer different classes of service, but also allows them to achieve load sharing across unequal cost path. Just like the example here, you can see 300 meg is going through the top links, and then 250 meg is going through the bottom links. In some cases, this load sharing can postpone the need of bandwidth upgrade in the service provider call due to some traffic can be routed through other non-shot test paths that may have available bandwidth. It can be a temporary solution if you still have some links that have available bandwidth and you want to route some traffic over them. Besides multiple services and traffic engineering, MPLS does also support quality of service or QoS. It is similar to deep serve in IP routing. Traffic marking and policing typically happen at the edge of the network. The main difference would be MPLS uses a three-bit traffic class field in its header to differentiate different types of traffic compared to an 8-bit type of service in IPv4 or traffic class field in IPv6 header. Here's a quick summary and comparison between IP, native internet, and MPLS technology. So IP is based on the destination. Same for Ethernet, it will be based on layer 2 destination. For MPLS, it will be label-based. And for IP, it is using IP header. Ethernet is using Ethernet header, MPLS will be using MPLS header. For OAM path, IP will be ping and trace route, Ethernet will be Ethernet OAM, and MPLS will be MPLS ping and trace route. This is a timeline of the evolution of MPLS, starting from 1996 that Epsilon, Cisco, and IBM announced the level switching plan. Until now, there are more than 280 RFCs or requests for comments for MPLS technologies. RFCs are the standard documentation for a specific technical standard. This diagram demonstrates the scenario of MPLS applications. MPLS is capable of providing multiple services such as layer three VPN, and layer two VPN. Those services can be further optimized with traffic engineering that can direct traffic through a specific path, as well as quality service that offer congestion management and congestion avoidance based on the traffic marking. So all together, we actually can combine all the technologies that MPLS can offer to provide an end-to-end -end service to the customer. Do you have any question up to this point? No, then next. Now, after we knew what MPLS is and what MPLS can do, let's move forward to understand how it works. This is a simple diagram showing how a router processes regular IP packets and MPLS packets. For IP routing, the router exchanges information with other routers using dynamic routing protocols and install routes into its routing information base or RIP. To speed up the forwarding, the router creates a forwarding information base or FIP, which is a compact and hardware-friendly database for destination address lookup. On the other hand, MPLS typically uses Label Distribution Protocol, or LDP, to exchange label information with other MPLS-enabled routers to populate its label information base, or LIP. Based on the information in RIP and LIP, the router can create label forwarding information base, LFIP, which is a compact and hardware-friendly database for label switching. So if an incoming packet is an IP packet, the router will perform destination address lookup and forward it based on FIP. And in case it is an MPLS packet or it is an IP packet that has a matching MPLS forwarding entry, 
then the router will forward the packet based on LFIT. There are some MPLS terminologies that we need to be familiar with, such as label switch router or LSR. It is a generic term for a router that supports MPLS. And label edge router or LER, it is also known as an edge LSR. It is an LSR that operates at the edge of the MPLS network. This router is also called PE or provider edge in MPLS VPN scenario. The level switch path is a path through an MPLS network or part of it that the packets take. So you can see here, the center two routers here are the LSR, and then the two routers here are LER, and then the path from LER to LER is an LSP. An MPLS level is the core of all MPLS technologies. It is a four byte header to be encapsulated between layer two header and layer three header. That's why some people also refer to MPLS as layer 2.5. In each MPLS level, it contains four fields, a 20 bit label value, a three bit traffic class value, a one bit bottom of stack value, and an eight bit time to live value. Technically, multiple labels can be used in MPLS encapsulation. This is done by packing the labels into a stack known as MPLS label stack. The bottom of stack field of the last MPLS label will be set to one, while all the other labels will have zero in this field. Basically, the bottom of stack is for identifying whether this is the last MPLS label in the stack. Some MPLS applications, such as VPN or traffic engineering, actually need more than one level to work. For example, an MPLS layer 3 VPN would typically require two levels, one for MPLS forwarding between the PEs, known as the transport level, and another one for identifying customer on the destination PE. This is known as the service level. The transport level is at the top of the stack, and the service level is at the bottom of the stack. In order to establish an LSP for each destination, MPLS routers along the path will need to exchange level information with each other. It is just like IP routing. IP routing, the routing protocols will need to exchange the routing information. Then for, I, uh, for MPLS, it will be the level information. There are a few protocols that commonly used for label distribution, such as LDP or label distribution protocol, RSVPTE or resource reservation protocol with traffic engineering extension, and MPBGP or multi-protocol border gateway protocol. Basically, BGP is extended to support multiple protocol and then one of its extension is to advertise the label for MPLS. Labels are typically allocated from downstream routers to the upstream routers. In MPLS, a forwarding equivalence class or FAC is a group of flow of packets that forwarded along the same path and are treated the same in terms of forwarding. For example, packets with the same destination address matching a certain prefix. They are typically in the same forwarding equivalence class. There are three possible operations when an MPLS packet is received by a label switch router or LSR before forwarding to the next hub. Post is an operation of adding an MPLS label to the packet. Swap is an operation of replacing the topmost label to a new neighbor. And pop is an operation of, of removing the topmost label. So post at the label, swap change the label, and pop, remove the label. This diagram demonstrates an example of MPLS forwarding operations. The IP packet in this example has the destination address of 100.1.1.1, .1 which is an address of the loopback zero interface in R4. This one. When the packet comes to R1, 
R1 will perform the destination address lookup and find that 100.1.1.1 slash 32 is the longest match for this destination. So as mentioned earlier, R1 will check first whether this is to forward with IP or with MTLS. And finally, it found a record. In addition, R1 also noticed that there is a matching MPLS entry for 100.1.1.1 slash 32, which has an outgoing level of 100. Therefore, R1 will automatically impose 100 onto the packet and forward it to the next hop based on that MPLS forwarding entry. This operation is known as push. So when R1 check and see, oh, this is a this is a destination that supports MPLS, then R1 will push a level and forward it with MPLS. If R1 did not find the matching MPLS entry, then R1 will simply just route it with a regular IP routing. After R1 impose the level, the packet is now an MPLS packet. Once it arrives at R2, R2 will do forwarding lookup and find a matching entry saying to replace the level from 100 to 200, then forward it to the next hub. This operation is known as swap. All the routers along the path will do swap operation, will do the swap operation as R2 did until the packet arrives to the router that the destination belongs to. In this case, it is R4. So in this diagram, R2 and R3, both they are doing the swap operation until the packet arrives to R4. When the packet arrives, R4 will first perform MPLS forwarding lookup and find that there is no outgoing level for this packet because this IP is directly connected to R4. So R4 does not need a level to forward it further. Therefore, it will pop the level it will remove the level. And after removing the level, the packet will become regular IP packet again. So R4 will perform another destination address lookup and process the packet with regular IP routing. From this example, we can see R4 is doing two things. R4 needs to process the MPLS packet first, then R4 needs to do the IP routing. So actually, the first level lookup is unnecessary because the destination is already connected to R4. R4 does not really need to process MPLS before processing the IP routing. That's why in MPLS, there is a process called penultimate hop popping or PHP. It is for optimizing this. With penultimate hop popping or PHP, R4 will assign an implicit null value instead of an actual number for all the destinations that are directly connected to it. So in this case, 100.1.1.1 slash 32 will be assigned an implicit null level. When R3 looks up the MPLS forwarding table for the packet with an incoming level of 200, it will see the outgoing level is implicit null now. Yeah, because R4 assign implicit null and appetize to R3. So R3 will see the out level is no longer a, a specific number. It is an implicit null. Based on this instruction, R3 will perform the pop operation instead of swap and forward the packet with out level to R4. So R4 will receive the regular IP packet and it will do only destination address lookup as the regular IP routing, no MPLS process is needed anymore. And by the way, the implicit null, actually it has a label value of three. This is a reserve value for special purpose for implicit null. Like in IP routing, MPLS employs time to live or TTL for loop prevention. There is a setting called TTL propagation used for determining whether to copy the IP TTL to MPLS TTL at the ingress point of the MPLS network and to copy MPLS TTL back to IP TTL at the egress point of the MPLS network. TTL propagation is enabled by default in Cisco IOS with the TTL propagation enabled if the user happens to do trace route, the MPLS routers and levels along the path 
would typically be visible in the trace route output. Alternatively, it can be disabled to hide the MPLS network topology. Then the LSRs will no, will no longer be visible in the user trace route output. So the user might still see PE, but they will not see the P routers. Cisco IOS has MPLS ping and trace route command to provide specific options for diagnosing MPLS data plan. Here is an example of the MPLS ping command in Cisco IOS. And here is an example of MPLS trace route command in Cisco IOS. Labels are shown in the trace route. This one, depending on your operating system, most of the routers, you, you will have an option to show the label, but this might not be the case for the Windows operating system. If you are doing trace in the Windows, you might not see the label, but in the router, you will see the label along the path like this. This hub is using 200, this one is using 19, and this is implicit now. Last but not least, we will talk about MTU or maximum transmission unit. In the regular IP routing, IP MTU indicates the maximum size of the IP packet that can be sent on the data link without fragmentation. In MPLS network, because one or more labels will be placed on top of the IP header. For example, MPLS layer 3 VPN will require two labels to work, a transport label plus a service label. As a result of this, the total length of the MPLS packet will be eight bytes bigger than its IP payload. Because one label is four bytes, so if you have two labels, it will be eight bytes. And later, if Let's say when we talk about segment routing, there might be multiple levels. In that case, you will have multiple four bytes on top of the IP payload. So if the original IP packet is 1,500 bytes, then after adding two four byte MPLS levels, it will become 1,508. And it is essential to understand whether your underlying network can support an MPLS packet size of 1,508. I think for modern networks should be okay because most of the modern equipment, they do support the Jumbo MTU. So in that case, 1508 is not an issue totally. And even some service providers, they are supporting something like 9,000 for the MPLS MT MTU. However, if your router might have issue with this, there are two ways to address the issue. If your router is not uh, Jumbo MTU, first, Maybe you need to check whether your layer 2 MTU is okay. If layer 2 MTU can support more than 1508, then you can directly configure an MPLS MTU of 1508. Alternatively, if your layer 2 MTU is not big enough, let's say you don't have Jumbo MTU, then we can tell the router to adjust the TCP maximum segment size to be smaller. In this example, a TCP MSS of 1452 will typically produce a 1,500 byte MPLS packet. Because 1,452 bytes of payload plus 20 bytes of TCP header and 20 bytes of IP header and finally 8 bytes of MPLS header will be totally 1,500. But I have to say the solution too for adjusting the TCP MSS, it will only work when you are uh, your protocol that MT MPLS is trying to tunnel is an IP protocol. If you are doing like layer two VPN, it will be an ethernet frame, then adjusting the TCP MSS would not help totally. Okay, so this is the basic introduction about MPLS. Any question before I go to the next presentation that I will talk about LDP? Yes, will not work because for L2 VPN, it is not TCP. So the router cannot really adjust the TCP MSS. Yeah, but sure you can you can tell your customer to to not not to send the 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 frame bigger than a certain size. But I think this is not an issue with the modern network. 
because uh, most of the modern service providers that are supporting L2 VPN, they typically have Jumbo MTU in the core. So in that case, it should be okay. Makito, sorry, one question. Uh, is there any fragmentation can happen if the size is bigger than supposed? So no. Cannot? The packet will be dropped. Okay, so let me switch to the next presentation. All right. In this second presentation, we will we will talk about LDP and basic MPLS configuration. LDP stands for Label Distribution Protocol. It is the protocol for exchanging label between MPLS routers. Actually, besides LDP, there are a few more protocols that can be used for advertising MPLS labels such as the resource reservation protocol with the traffic engineering extension or RSVPTE and the multi-protocol border gateway protocol or MPBGP and some interior gateway protocol IGPs like OSPF and ISIS. While there are some limitations on LDP, for instance, LDP was not designed for traffic engineering capability in place like RSVPTE or inter-domain support like MPBGP, but LDP is still the most classic and widespread one among all the protocols, maybe because it is simple and previously Cisco heavily promoted LDP. Yes. Um, Okay, uh, actually for the IGP part, it is still LDP is the most common one because MPBGP is not used for advertising the transport level most of the time. It is used for advertising the VPN level. Like if you are running layer three or layer two VPN, then MPBGP will be used for advertising that service level, but not the transport level. So still for the transport level, LDP is commonly used, but sure some networks, they might use RSVPTE for traffic engineering purpose. And in our session three, we will talk about segment routing. Then that one is an alternative if you don't want to run LDP or RSVPTE because segment routing has the simplicity of LDP and also at the same time, it has the capability of traffic engineering like RSVPT. The reason why many people are running LDP, because there are some advantages of running it, such as the reliability, auto provision, plug and play, and it can support large number of level switch paths. Because LDP uses reliable TCP as the transport protocol for the message, except when it is discovering the LDP peer the neighboring, the, from the neighboring routers, then it will use UDP. In addition, LDP has ability to set up LSPs dynamically based on the routing information. It is also simple to deploy and configure LDP compared to other protocols like RSVPTE and MPBGP. Because actually, if you want to configure LDP on the router, only a few commands you need to you need to use. Specifically, like in Cisco IOS, you just need to enable MPLS IP on the interface. Or even there is a command called uh, LDP auto config. So basically, it will run LDP on all your IGP links. 
So it is simple compared to RSVPTE. While in RSVPTE, you will need to set the bandwidth value on the interface and then you will need to signal specific LSP one by one. Similar to other routing protocols, each router running LDP has a unique LDP identifier. This identifier is a six octet quantity used for identifying an LSR level space. It contains a four bytes LSR ID and a two bytes level space ID. The LSR ID is typically the loopback interface of the router and a zero level space ID indicates that the level space is per platform, while a non-zero means the level space is per interface. In Cisco IOS, the LDP identifier can be shown using the command show MPLS LDP discovery. Then here you can see it is like the router ID of the routing protocol. In per platform level space, one single level is assigned to a destination network and announce it to all the peers. The level must be locally unique and valid on all the incoming interfaces. In another word, the router expects the same incoming MPLS level for each destination network, regardless of incoming interface of the MPLS packet. And in per interface level space, the local levels are assigned to each destination network on a per interface basis. These levels must be unique on a per interface basis. Therefore, the router has different expectation on incoming MPLS levels for different incoming interface, even if the destination is the same. Per interface level space was typically applied to the legacy ATM or asynchronous transfer mode networks, which is rare in today's network deployments. For LDP to be fully operational, there are three main steps. First of all, it is neighbor discovery. The router will try to discover whether its neighboring routers are also running LDP. This is similar to exchanging hello messages in some interior gateway protocols. The discovery packets are sent over UDP. Once the router found that its neighboring routers are also running LDP, it will attempt to establish a reliable LDP session with them using TCP. Finally, when the session is established, the router will start to exchange level information with its LDP peers. Here is a list of command messages that are being used in LDP. We can see for the discovery, it will be hello message, for the session setup will be initialization and keep a live message. And then there are some other messages such as level release, level request, level mapping, withdrawal for level distribution. And there's notification message to signal the error information. By default, LDP performs basic discovery to find directly connected peer. Discovery messages are sent to UDP port 646 for all the router's multicast address 224.0.0.2. The source address is typically the loopback address of the local router. Besides the basic discovery, there is an extended discovery that LDP uses to say hello to a non-directly connected peer. The extended discovery message are sent to UDP port 646 but the destination address is a unicast address, which is commonly the loopback address of the peer router. After the initial discovery, all routers will attempt to establish TCP connection for setting up the LDP session. They will go through a series of message exchange. Once both peer receive keep a live message from each other, then the session is up. Keep a live messages are also used for maintaining the session. After the LDP sessions are established, labels will be distributed between LDP peers. The label distribution mode used is depending on the interface type and also the platform implementation. There are two distribution control mode, ordered and independent. Same for label advertisement mode, there are downstream on demand, DOD, and downstream unsolicited, DU. For the level retention mode, also we have liberal and conservative. We will talk more about each mode in the coming slides. First, 
in all the label distribution control mode, the router will only assign a local label for IGP prefixes that are marked as directly connected in its routing table, or also for the IGP prefixes which it already received a label from the next hub router. In the independent label distribution control mode, each router creates a local binding for a particular fact as soon as it recognizes the fact. Usually, this means that the prefix for the fact is in its routing table. By the way, after this, I will also say about uh, what is the default configuration on each platform, such as in Cisco, what they use, in Juniper, what they use. In downstream on-demand label advertisement mode, the router distributes labels to a specific forwarding equivalence class of fact only after receiving label request message from its upstream router. That's why it is on demand. And for the unsolicited one, each router will distribute the label to its upstream router anyway without those routers requesting the labels. In liberal label retention mode, the router keeps all received remote labels in its label information base or lib, but not all are used for forwarding packet. In conservative label retention mode, the router does not store all the remote labels in its label information base, but it stores only a remote label that is associated to the next hub router for a particular forwarding equivalence class. Okay, this is the main point. For the default configuration in each platform, Cisco is using the independent and downstream unsolicited liberal and per platform for frame mode. Frame mode means the MPLS with Ethernet. And for cell mode MPLS, this is the legacy ATM. Cisco will use all the DOD conservative and per interface. For Juniper, it will be all the and can be either of this, and the retention mode is liberal. For Huawei, by default, it is like this, but it is also supporting this. Since LDP sessions are mostly established between directly connected peers, the session can go down when the direct point-to-point -point link between two routers is down. Then this one will cause some labels to be removed from the router's label information base. LDP session protection is a feature that the LDP peers can use targeted or multi-hop hello message to maintain the session while their direct point-to-point -point link is down. The LDP link adjacency is removed when the link is down, but the targeted adjacency will keep the LDP session up. This is useful when you have a link flap. Maybe you don't want your LDP session down and all the labels disappear just because of a link flap, then you can enable the session protection. Question? Uh, for this slide, uh, so does it mean that uh, if we have in the same system, uh, devices from different companies, they do not necessarily uh, interoperate. In order for them to interrupt, I think we should at least configure to be the same. For example, Cisco has its way of doing the work. Then if, let's say, we are using a Juniper or Huawei router, then we can try to configure the mode that it can work with Cisco to, to be consistent. It's up to the administrator in order to try to yeah, um, we can figure to match them. Yes. I think a related question. So if I don't have uh, a router from any of these vendors, and uh, is there any like open source implementation of the LDP protocol that I can install uh, in a generic? Yes. There are some. Personally, I, I have tried the Free Ranger routing or FRR. Yeah, yeah, this platform, it does support LDP not only on IPv4, but also on IPv6. Besides this, there might be others, but I just did not try. Okay, so next, 
after learning about the basic concepts of MPLS and LDP, we will move forward with some MPLS configuration and verification examples in Cisco iOS platform. There are four routers in this example topology. And by the way, some of you might say, hey, why are you always talking about Cisco iOS? <laughs> Actually, because in our session two, our lab will be based on Cisco iOS XE. So it is just, um, you know, help you to be familiar with a few Cisco commands before the hands-on. All right, there are four routers in this example topology. Each router has a loopback interface with a slash 32 IPv4 address on it. Our task is to configure the MPLS LDP on Cisco IOS to set up the MPLS LSP only for the loopback addresses. We do not want to allocate and distribute levels for other networks such as point-to-point -point link. Because in reality, when, when you are running a service provider call, you will need to transport MPLS packets from loopback to loopback, but not point-to-point -point link. So actually assigning level for point-to-point -point links is not necessary. So there is no harm to do it, but just if you want to optimize your level information base to be smaller, not to allocate the unnecessary levels, then you can do the filter. Before we start to configure MPLS LDP, we will need the IP addresses and IGP configuration to be ready. So actually, ID, uh, LDP is not a protocol for advertising the prefix in, in, the, in the network. You need to use IGP to advertise your loopback and other prefixes before you run LDP. LDP is just adding a level on top of that. It is fine either we use OSPF or ISIS as long as all our loopback addresses have reachability to each other. Uh, in fact, if you don't want to use a routing protocol, you can technically use static route, although this will not happen in the real world implementation. Most of the time, the service provider will use OSPF or ISIS. Mainly, we need to have reachability between loopbacks. In another word, each router should be able to see the loopback addresses of other routers in its routing table. First of all, we need, to imp we need to enable basic MPLS and LDP on all the routers. In Cisco IOS, we will need to run several commands like this. First of all, we need to make sure that Cisco Express Forwarding is running. Actually, this is important, IPCF here, because I used to see the case that MPLS is not working. And finally, it is because IPCEF is not enabled. And then you can set the level range by using the command MPLS level range from which number to which number. This is OK. This is optional. It is not required. By default, it has a level range in the platform already. And then the third command is for configuring the router ID. Most of the time, we will use the loopback zero as the router ID. And after these three commands, in each interface that you want to run LDP, basically, you can use MPLS IP command. Plus, actually, this one, I believe it is optional also, MPLS level protocol LDP, because for most of the Cisco platforms currently, LDP is already the default protocol for level distribution. The reason why here there is a command MPLS level protocol LDP, because long time ago, Cisco had a protocol called TDP, Tech Distribution Protocol, for distributing the levels. But now it is default to LDP already. After... No call is significant. After enabling the basic MPLS and LDP, we can use show MPLS interface command to verify the interfaces that have been configured to run LDP. So here it is the example. It will show the interface that we enabled LDP. And to check LDP discovery status, we can use show MPLS LDP discovery command from the output, we can see that the LDP identifier of the local router 
and the LDP identifiers of remote peers that the router has received hello from them. Basically, this is your local LDP ID, and then these are the interfaces that you received hello and then their LDP ID. The show MPLS LDP neighbor command is used for showing current status of the LDP session. From the output, we can see source and destination transport addresses and ports that are used for establishing the LDP session. This is the source and destination, and this is the IP that we use for establishing the LDP. Most of the time, the transport address also will be loopback. Also, the operational state is status upper is operational. It indicates that the LDP session is currently up and stable. And this is the show MPLS LDP neighbor command output in router 2, which is uh, this one in router 2. Then you can see router 2 is having the LDP with router 1 and router 3. And yes, this is with router 1, 10.0.0.1. This is with router 1. And 10.0.0.3, it is with router 3. But router 2 is having two interfaces with router 3. Although there are two links between router 2 and router 3, only single LDP session will be established. And after the LDP session establishment, we can now check the level information base or lib to see the labels that are located by the local router and the label that it received from the remote routers using the command show MPLS LDP bindings. For showing specific destination, we can use show MPLS LDP bindings followed by the destination address and its prefix length. So it is like this. This is for showing the entire database. This is for showing a specific destination. Local binding means the level that the local router has assigned for this destination. Remote binding means if you want to forward to this destination through this router, what level you need to use, and through this router, what level you need to use. While the local, while the level information base lib store all the local and remote bindings, not all of them are used. To show the label that actually being used, we can use the command show MPLS forwarding table command. Because as we can see in the previous slide, although in router two, it can see the destination of router four through router one and router three. But in reality, router one and router three, router two will only use router three to reach router four because router one is not the short test part to reach router four. That's why although in the LDP binding has a record from, from router three, but router two will not really use this level in its forwarding table. That's why here you can see, sorry, uh, although there is router one in here, but it will not use this router one in its forwarding table. That's why in here, the forwarding table, we can see for the destination 10.0.0.4, it is using the label that router 3 assigns, not the one that router 1 assigns. Yeah, it will be based on the short test part. Because LDP is not designed with the traffic engineering in mind, so LDP is using the short test part. Basically, it, it is based on your routing table whatever route that your routing table will take. Okay. To show the lab value, you can use show MPLS forwarding table. This command's output shows how the router will process each incoming packet. For example, for the destination address 10.34.0.0 slash 30, the local level is 203, and the outgoing level is top level. This means that the router will pop the label for an incoming packet with the label of 203 and forward it as the regular IP packet to the next hub. So if you are on router 2 and router 2 receive a packet with label 203, router 2 will remove the label and just forward it to the next hub as an IP packet without label. Because 
here the outgoing level is pop. And why outgoing level is pop? Let's go back and see our diagram. Okay. This one. Because 10.34.0.0 is a directly connected link to R3. So from R3 point of view, R3 will assign implicit now for this directly connected link and then advertise to R2. That's why from R2, R2 will see that the outgoing level for this destination is pop because it is directly connected to R3. Another example would be for destination address 10.0.0.4 slash 32. The local level is 204 and the outgoing level is 300. In this case, the router will perform swap operation to replace 204 to 300 and forward the packet as an MPLS packet to the next hub. Yeah, because it is not popped yet, it just changed from one level to another level. It is still an MPLS packet then the next hub will still need to process it as MPLS. Before we move on, I would like to highlight that in this output, we still can see other non-loopback destination, for example, this slash 30 point-to-point -point link, because so far we still did not do any filtering yet. So by default, LDP will assign level for all the IGP routes, including the point-to-point. -point. But at the beginning of this diagram of this example, we mentioned that we want to allocate only for loopbacks. We don't want to allocate for point-to-point -point link. So there will be still another step that we need to do. It is the filtering. Actually, it is optional, but just I will show you how to do the filtering. As said in the previous slide, we are going to implement the filter that allows the router to allocate levels for loopback addresses only. To implement this in Cisco IOS, we need to first create a prefix list matching all the loopback addresses. Then we can apply the prefix list using allocate global prefix list command under MPLS LDP label configuration mode. In our example topology, we have an addressing plan that all the loopbacks are in 10.0.0.0/24, which is easy because they are in the same prefix. So we just simply use a single statement to match all of them. But if you have the IP address from different subnets, then in that case, you might need to have multiple statements in your prefix list to match all of them. That's why it is recommended to have a structure addressing plan when designing the network, especially with the consideration of all potential policies that it may be in place in the future. Specifically for the loopback, it is always good to assign a prefix for all the loopbacks. Maybe a slash 24 for IPv4 and then a slash 64 for IPv6. And then you use only one IP for each loopback from, from the pool. Okay, so after applying the command, to verify whether it is working, we can run show MPLS LDP bindings before and after and compare the result. This is the output before we apply the filter. We can see many slash 30s here because this is before applying the filter. And after applying the filter, we can see the bindings contain only slash 32, which are the loopback addresses. So only slash 32 loopback addresses have the labels now. And here is an example of checking the level switch path for destination 10.0.0.4 slash 32 from router 1 to router 3. We can use the command show MPLS forwarding table in each router to see the local levels and the outgoing level for this destination. So on router 1, show MPLS forwarding table this destination, this prefix length, we will see outgoing level is 204 meaning router one will put 204. And then when router two, if we show, we see incoming is 204, outgoing is 300. It means when it receives 204, it will swap to 300. And then router three, when it receives 300, 
it will pop the level. Yes, there are three operations. Push means put the level, at the level, and then swap means to change the level from one to another, and pop means to remove the level. Yeah, this is uh, the standard operation, but there is an issue if we are using the MPLS traffic class to record the QoS marking. Remember earlier I mentioned about in MPLS level, there is a field that we can take note the QoS marking. It is the traffic class. Then if we remove the level, then how R4 will know what marking we have for this packet? Because R4 will only receive a regular IP packet, then it does not have the MPLS label on it anymore. So that's why the QoS information that the label carries will be lost. So in this case, there is a solution. We can retain this information by configuring LDP to allocate the explicit null instead of implicit null. Implicit null means to pop the label, while explicit null means to change the label to an explicit null value of zero for IPv4 or value of two for IPv6. When the outgoing level is explicit null, router three will no longer pop the level. Instead, it will swap the level from 300 to zero because this is an IPv4 destination. So it will swap from 300 to zero, which is explicit null. For the case of IPv6, it will be 300 to two it will be explicit now for IPv6. So when the packet arrive at R4, it will still be an MPLS packet and the QoS information is retained. However, doing so will have the side effect on router four. That router four will need to process the packet twice, will need to process with MPLS and then finally process with IP routing. Yep. This is depending on our requirement. If you don't carry QoS information, you don't need R4 to do anything on this QoS marking, then no need to enable explicit null. Explicit null only require when you want to carry this marking up to R4 and you want R4 to do something based on this. To enable explicit null in Cisco IOS, we can use the command of MPLS LDP explicit null in global configuration mode. After applying the command, we can see R3's MPLS forwarding table is saying that the outgoing level for 10.0.0.4 slash 32 is now explicit now. Based on this, R3 will perform the swap instead of pop. Then R4 will receive an MPLS packet. All right, that's all for the LDP presentation. And now we come to the end of the Session one, do you have any question before I close the session? Yes. Uh, to reduce the performance of the router or what? Uh, is it non and explicit now? Because uh, is, it, is, uh, is it because of the swap, uh, swap uh, things uh, give impact on the router or what? Yes, uh, the reason why we need to have the implementation of implicit null, because if without implicit null, the packet will arrive to the last hop, arrive to the router 4 with MPLS level. So in that case, router 4 will need to process it twice. First with MPLS forwarding, another one with regular IP routing. That's why there is a concept of using implicit now that router three can remove the level before sending to router four, just to avoid router four to process it twice. But for the case of retaining QoS information, if we pop the level when forwarding to router four, then router four will not have the QoS information. That's why explicit now is an option that we can enable. Then we, we simply tell router three say that don't do pen ultimate hop popping when you send the packet to router 4, still keep the label, but just change the label number to zero in order to carry the QoS information to router 4. And the side effect would be router 4 will need to process this packet twice, as it doesn't have implicit now, as it doesn't have the penultimate hop popping. Yeah. It is a choice, I would say. If 
you concerned about performance and you don't have to do anything on router 4, explicit now is not required. But if you have the QoS marking that you have to apply some policies on router 4, then you can choose to enable explicit now to make sure that the router 4 will receive this marking, will receive this information. Thank you. Okay, uh, let's go and have a look at the forwarding table. Here, for example, on router 2, it is interesting that we see each destination, there are two rows here. Actually, because router 2 is having two links to router 3, and these two links may be equal cost. So in that case, it will do ECMP. It will do the load sharing between two links. That's why, yes, there is a situation that incoming 204 might be forwarded out through two links to the destination. In this case, because router 2 is connecting to router 3 with two links, that's why we see the outgoing level is 300, 300 on both parts here. But you can imagine if between router 2 and router 4, not only having router 3, imagine we have another router 5 here, router 2 connect to router 5 and router 5 connect to router 4. Then in that case, router 2 will have two paths to go to router 4. One is through router 3, another one is through the additional router 5. Then in that case, you will see the label values different. You will see the outgoing label to router 3 might be different from outgoing level to router 5. Yes, ECMP can happen with MPLS forwarding, but it depends on the platform. As far as I know, in some platform like Microtech Router OS version 6, it does not support ECMP forwarding for MPLS. So it will choose only one path. But for Cisco, yes, it supports ECMP. Any more question? If no question, then I will finish this session one. And in session two, we will run the lab together. We will run a lab. Let me show you in advance a little bit. Then you can know what to expect. In session two, we will run a lab together, which is MPLS LDP and MPLS layer 3 VPN lab with Cisco iOS. Basically, we will do the configuration using Cisco iOS XE to establish the basic LDP neighbor relationship. And on top of that, we will run multi-protocol BGP with VPN v4 address family to show you the application of MPLS, how you can use MPLS to provide a layer 3 VPN to the customer if you are a service provider. Okay, we will do this together in session two. And in order to run this lab again, you will need an APNIC Academy account. If you don't have yet, you can go and register. It just needs basic information like your name, your email address, and it is free. Just register for it, then you can launch the lab together in session two. All right, so thank you very much for joining session one and hope to see you all again in session two. Thank you. Uh, yes, session two will be 11 to 12.30. Oh, by the way, just to remind again, I brought some gift here, some socks, bags, or pens, and also my business card. So if any of you would like to take any of them, then feel free to take it from here.